This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. In today's video, I want to explore the life of a man who spent the better part of 16 years as the Constable of the Tower of London, and he did so during the reign of King Henry VIII. In this role, he would serve his monarch during some of the most turbulent years in the history of England. In historical fiction that's focused on this period, he is frequently a heavily featured supporting character. But in this episode, we're going to make him the focus. But before we jump into today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring another video on this channel. Squarespace has made building, updating and managing my website so easy. With Squarespace Blueprint, it's now even easier. This guided website design system asks you just a few questions, and then from that, it helps you to create a well-designed and personal website. You can then make any changes to that website that you wish, from fonts to colours to images, etc. You can do it all through the Fluid Engine Editor. And that is also so simple. It's literally just drag and drop. From showing off my most popular videos on YouTube, to hosting my merch store, to managing my mailing list, my Squarespace website offers me everything I need. And as I've mentioned before, I absolutely love the fact that I can use Squarespace either through my desktop or laptop, but also through the app on my phone. Whether I'm analysing traffic or editing the website itself, I can do what I need to do from absolutely anywhere. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash reading the past to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. But now it's time to take a look at the man that Henry VIII trusted to take charge of his Tower of London. Let's see what we can learn about Sir William Kingston. We don't know much about William Kingston's early life or his origins. We think he was born in around 1476, so in the last decade-ish of the conflict we know today as the Wars of the Roses. It is thought that his family were from Gloucestershire and that county did play host to one of the most decisive battles in that conflict, namely the Battle of Tewkesbury that took place on the 4th of May 1471. At that battle, the Yorkist forces routed the Lancastrians. Henry VI's only son and heir, Edward, was killed. Henry VI would die a little over two weeks later. We have no record of William's thoughts on the conflict and upheaval that likely formed a backdrop to his early years. But is it not feasible that this conflict may have instructed his approach to royal service in the future? Might it perhaps have inspired in him a desire to maintain the rulers he served? to support their dynastic ambitions and see off any threats to them or their plans as a means of ensuring an ongoing peace in England. How might this experience have made him view those who were imprisoned in the Tower of London on the orders of Henry VIII while he was the constable there? William probably joined royal service in his early 20s. He was made a yeoman of the chamber to King Henry VII. He also occupied a position of trust and respect within the wider community, as he was a Justice of the Peace for Gloucestershire from 1506. In 1509, he served as a gentleman usher at the funeral of King Henry VII. Following this, he continued on in the royal service of Henry VII's son and heir, King Henry VIII. In 1510, so soon after the rule began, William and Arthur Plantagenet, also known as Viscount Lyle, were granted a licence which allowed them to export 2,000 woollen kerseys without paying duty on them, a sign that both men had already achieved the favour of the new king, the kind of favour that brought with it financial rewards. In 1511, William's new royal master joined into a holy league with his father-in-law, Ferdinand of Aragon. King Henry VIII thus began to make ready to go to war with France. William would begin by receiving military supplies. 
and then, in 1512, he was made an under-marshal. He travelled to San Sebastian in northern Spain, in the hopes that at that spot, right near the French border, English forces might enjoy the military support of their promised allies. As it was, that support would be found to be lacking at this time. William, probably a little crestfallen that this mission had not brought the outcome that his monarch desired, returned to England before the end of the year. When Henry VIII set out on his French campaign in 1513, William was not selected to be part of his party. Instead, he remained in England, and so he was on hand when Henry VIII's brother-in-law, James IV of Scots, invaded. As Regent of England in her husband's absence, Queen Catherine of Aragon ordered that an army should be raised in response to this invasion, and William was part of the English force that met with the invaders at the Battle of Flodden on the 9th of September 1513. At this battle, these Scottish troops were defeated. Many prominent Scotsmen were killed in action, including James IV himself. His 17-month-old son, also called James, was left to become king after him. The month after this English victory, William was knighted for his troubles. In 1514, he was chosen to be one of the few who waited upon the king at his meals as his sewer. According to Stanford Lemberg, this was a role that came with a stipend of 40 marks a year. In the same year, he was also selected to be Sheriff of Gloucestershire, and thus he was being tasked with upholding the law. He was, for example, told to capture those who were deemed to be heretics. During these years of increasing influence and evident displays of royal favour, where he served his monarch as a soldier and official, William was also able to join his king in some of that monarch's favoured pastimes, on the tournament ground and in the lavish entertainments of the court. When Henry's expanded privy chamber drew the condemnation of his counsellors, principal amongst them Thomas Wolsey, due to the expense but also the behaviour of these men and the influence it was thought they had over the king, it was demanded that their number be heavily reduced. William was, though, seemingly deemed to be a trustworthy influence. He became one of four knights of the Privy Chamber. This role earned him £100 a year. According to the National Archives Currency Converter, that is the equivalent of roughly £52,000 a year in 2017 money. Henry's banished favourites would soon start dribbling back to court and to favour. But William remained in attendance on his king. He would even obtain further responsibilities, such as becoming keeper of the royal jewels and plate. It is suggested that William was part of Sir Richard Wingfield's diplomatic mission to France in 1520. And it's possible that William is who Wingfield is referring to in his letter to Henry VIII, which is dated to the 20th of April. In it, he recounts a visit to the young Dauphin, who apparently, quote, took a marvellous pleasure in young Kingston, whom, after he had seen once, he called him Beaufy, whom he would sometime have kneeled down and sometime stand up. In effect, sir, I have not seen any child take a greater fantasy to no creature than he did to the said Kingston. I do wonder, considering that William would be at least 40 by this point, if anyone would have described him as young Kingston. If not, then this is probably a reference to William's son, Anthony, who would have been around 12 at this point. We aren't sure who Anthony's mother was. William married three times, and we don't know the dates of these marriages, how long each marriage lasted, or the exact order of them. The first two wives were Anne, she was the widow of Sir John Guise, and another wife was Elizabeth. Her surname is unknown. Anthony's mother was one of these two women. William's third wife, who he had married by 1534, was Mary. She was the widowed daughter of Richard Scrope. Now, if Wingfield is talking about Anthony here rather than William, then I think we should take this as a sign that Anthony's father would have had sufficient influence to either have his son accompany him on this important diplomatic mission or for him to have been able to place that son in a sufficiently prestigious household for an opportunity such as this namely to wow the Dauphin of France to come his way. William certainly would be in France a few months later, 
as he was part of the English delegation for the famed Field of Cloth of Gold. He stayed on with the royal party for the subsequent meeting with Charles V too. Henry VIII rewarded his service by gifting him an expensive horse purchased from one of the French courtiers. In the following year, 1521, William became one of Henry's carvers, which, like his role of sewer, placed him in the king's service for his meals. When the third Duke of Buckingham was accused of plotting against the king and tried for treason, William was a member of the jury that would convict him. Buckingham's fall and execution proved to be valuable for William. Henry bestowed on him the roles of steward and bailiff of Bedminster, Somerset, in addition to all the Duke's possessions in Gloucestershire. Henry made him constable of Thornbury Castle and master of all the hunts. The Act of Attainder against Buckingham enshrined William's new holdings into law. William would be elevated further still when he was granted the stewardship of the Duchy of Lancaster. And at some point prior to this, he had also obtained lodgings at Blackfriars. Indeed, Lemberg explains that William, quote, was granted three tenements with shops, cellars and gardens in the parish of St Martin near Ludgate to be held for the annual rent of a red rose. You may well be familiar with a peppercorn rent, but had you heard of a red rose rent before now? During 1521, William was also called regularly to attend upon his king and keep him company in the privy chamber. And so clearly then, the king must have liked William enough personally for him to wish for him to be part of his intimate circle in this way. In 1522 and 1523, however, military matters required his attention and they would draw him from court. During these years, he levied men to serve in France, he served in the Earl of Surrey's campaign in Scotland, and then in the Duke of Suffolk's mission to France. He was apparently much sought after by these military commanders. The next year, on the 28th of May 1524, William became the Constable of the Tower of London. This placed him in charge not only of that most imposing fortress, but also of the custody of numerous state prisoners during his tenure. In November 1530, William was, for example, commanded to go to Sheffield Park to meet with the party that had arrested Thomas Wolsey. He was tasked with conveying him back to London, where, no doubt, a trial, conviction and likely an execution would have awaited Wolsey, had he lived long enough. Wolsey's biographer, George Cavendish, presents William as a respectful custodian. It is also from Cavendish that we learn that it was to William that Wolsey gave his dying warning. Quote, I warn you, be well advised and assured what matter ye put in his head. And by this, he means Henry VIII. For ye shall never get it out again. The previous year, 1529, saw William take up a place in Parliament as Knight of the Shire for Gloucestershire, a role he would reprise in 1536. But between these two sittings, an awful lot would happen, much of which William would have a ringside seat for. I mean, at points, he even had a role to play in the events. Take, for example, the 13th of July, 1530. William was one of the signatories to a petition that was to be sent to the Pope. The petitioners were expressing their desire that Henry should receive his annulment from Catherine of Aragon. When Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn travelled to France in October 1532, in the hopes that they might obtain King Francis I's support for their future marriage, William was part of the party that travelled with them. Then, at the end of the following May, 1533, Anne Boleyn was received by William Kingston when she arrived at the Tower of London for the lavish celebrations that preceded her coronation on the 1st of June. Despite these supporting activities for his king's aims for his great matter and also in its aftermath, it is interesting, I think, that in a letter dated to the 4th of March 1535, Eustace Shapwee told his master Charles V that while he certainly feared that King Henry VIII would deal harshly with both Catherine of Aragon and their daughter Mary in case of any invasion or uprising in their cause, that Shapwee was comforted by the fact that he believed William Kingston would protect them. Shapwee writes that, quote, He seems to be a good servant of your majesty and the said ladies. Shapwee does not, however, elaborate on how he has come to this conclusion. Just over a year after that letter was sent, 
William would have a royal lady whose incarceration he had to deal with. In May 1536, he was overseeing the Tower of London when Anne Boleyn returned as a prisoner and alleged traitor. William would write to Thomas Cromwell, reporting how Anne had asked him if she was going to be held in a dungeon, to which he said, quote, No, madam, you shall go into the lodging you lay in at your coronation. He then reported her reply, quote, It is too good for me, she said. Jesu, have mercy on me, and kneeled down weeping apace, and in the same sorrow fell into a great laughing, and she hath done many times since. His treatment of Anne was reportedly respectful. Indeed, this is somewhat of a through line, that respectful treatment can be found in all of the prisoner interactions we have and that we know about with William Kingston. However, it is suggested that he was also gathering and prepared to provide evidence against Anne to be used at her trial. His wife attended upon Anne during this time. She served her as her state demanded, but she also surely was acting as the eyes and ears of those who were, at this point, tasked with prosecuting the Queen, just as the other ladies who attended her at this point were no doubt expected to do as well. Also housed in the Tower of London at this point, and for this same cause, were the men who were accused of being Anne's confederates and co-conspirators. The King's Hall at the Tower which no longer stands today, would play host to the trials of Anne and her brother George on the 15th of May 1536. In a letter to Cromwell that is dated to the following day, William asked, quote, to know the King's pleasure touching the Queen, as well for her comfort as the preparation of scaffolds and other necessaries concerning. Towards the end of this missive, he added, quote, yet this day at dinner, the Queen said that she should go to a nunnery and is in hope of life. As it was, William Kingston would escort Anne to her execution on the 19th of May, 1536. A few years later, in 1539, when the Act of Six Articles was being debated, William argued in favour of a more conservative future for the faith of his nation. He was apparently vehement in his support of the doctrine of transubstantiation. This is the belief that the bread and wine of the Eucharist were literally transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This devotion to traditional faith practice did not, however, apparently extend to the preservation of monasticism in England. Quite the opposite, in fact, because William profited from the dissolution of the monasteries. For example, he received Flaxley Abbey in Gloucestershire and all of the possessions that that abbey laid claim to also in 1539. So the same year that William was part of that debate over the Act of Six Articles, he was made comptroller of the King's household, a very senior position, and he was also inducted as a Knight of the Garter. Now I have made a video on this particular chivalric order, which I will be leaving linked. On the 10th of June 1540, the man that William had once so diligently reported to, Thomas Cromwell, was himself arrested and conveyed to the Tower of London. William was now tasked with managing this gentleman's imprisonment, with telling him of the charges that were levelled against him, and very likely with seeing that the King learned of Cromwell's response to his new circumstances. When Cromwell was found to be traitorous, his lands, titles and properties were forfeit to the Crown. William purchased two of his now newly available manors in Gloucestershire, namely Painswick and Morton Valance. Cromwell had previously bought them from the Lyle family for £1,400. William thus seems to have got them for a bargain, spending just £1,000 to acquire them for himself. Unfortunately for William, he would not enjoy his new manners for long, because on the 14th of September 1540, he died at Painswick. So what do you think of William Kingston? of his career and legacy. What qualities do you think he might have had that could account for his steady rise in prominence and also for the stability he seems to have enjoyed in terms of the favour of his king, especially when we consider the turmoil that was going on all around him? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. 
I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments because that will help to boost the engagement. And the more engagement video gets, the more YouTube claims they share it out. And that should help us to grow our community. As we've been talking about William Kingston, I feel like castles are the way to go in terms of emojis. But if you disagree, I'm happy to see what you pick on that front as well. You can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of them so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please share it with your friends. And if you like the channel in general, let some pals know about it. You can tell me that this video is the one for you by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you are subscribed, now is the ideal time to check. Make sure that YouTube has not mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will, because once again, I am receiving reports. And so while you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube allege that they will tell you when I've next uploaded, but also when I'm next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news, and I know you are not going to want to miss that. We have, of course, got our failsafe. If you head to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com, it will be linked. If you head to the contact page of the website, as you can see, there is a box. If you put your email in that box, that will add you to my mailing list, and that way I can send you out an email once a week to let you know what I've been up to, but also to share with you some useful links to my content that you might want for the coming days. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.